This is episode 43, Why You Haven't Found the One with Michael. Welcome to Over It and On With It. I'm your host, Christine Hassler, and for over a decade, I've been a life coach, speaker, and author. Each week, you'll hear me work directly with a caller as I coach them through a goal they want to accomplish or an obstacle they may be facing. I'll provide a blend of practical and spiritual advice as well as tangible actions you can apply to your own life. Now, let's get on with the episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome back. We just want to take a moment to celebrate all the amazing callers who've been part of these episodes and celebrate all of you listeners. Thank you so much. Each week, I'm so touched by the callers' courage and vulnerability and whenever I hear from any of you, so please keep reaching out. And today, I'm really moved to share my session with Michael because it's such a beautiful example of masculine vulnerability and strength. We cover so much, and my guess is you'll fall in love with Michael as I did. So speaking of falling in love, let's talk about finding the one. You know, that magical person that is your soulmate, your other half, the one who completes you. Notice the tone of sarcasm in my voice. And the sarcasm isn't there because I'm jaded or don't believe in love. I love love, and I'm very open about my strong intention to share my life with an amazing man and partner. What I don't love is some of the misunderstandings around soulmate and the pain so many of us go through when it comes to romantic relationships. So let me speak to the soulmate thing first. I believe there are lots of ones out there for us that every person we have a relationship with, especially a romantic relationship, is a soulmate. From my point of view, the definition of a soulmate is someone who helps our soul grow. Sometimes it's through a really gut-wrenching breakup. Sometimes it's through dating someone who really, really triggers us. Sometimes it's with someone who just comes in and, and loves us and holds up a beautiful mirror and helps remind us of who we are. So we've got to stop looking for that one person, that one soulmate out there, because you've already had lots of soulmates and there probably will be many more that come in the form of romantic relationships, friendships, colleagues, even someone that you may share a plane ride with once and never see again. So now let's talk about the pain part. Why are so many romantic relationships, everything from the pursuit of them to being in them to breakups, so painful sometimes? Well, a lot of this answer will be covered in my session with Michael, but here it is in a nutshell in terms of why relationships can be so painful. Number one, they are great mirrors and often trigger unresolved issues from our childhood. Number two, whatever needs our parents did not meet, we often look for in a romantic partner, which really doesn't attract the best people to us because we end up dating people like our parent who wasn't exactly what we wanted them to be. Number three, sometimes we want a relationship so badly to fill voids or make us feel less alone that we put on these lovely rose-colored glasses and move into what I call a fantasy-based relationship. So let me tell you about one of my past soulmates and relationships that I'm not super proud of, but see it as an incredible learning experience. So when I was in my last year of college, so like 2021, I met a man that I'll call John. He was eight years older than me. And from my perspective, just really cool. He had long hair, drove a Jeep, had his own business, this really rad dog, a house, and looks that turned heads no matter where he went. He also had a reputation of being a bit of a player, but when he asked me out at a party, I felt like I was the chosen one. I was so psyched for our first date that turned into a second date and a third date, and then soon I was his girlfriend. Awesome, right? Not so much. The fact that I was his girlfriend did not seem to stop him from flirting a lot with other women, often right in front of me. I consistently felt not enough and was terrified he would cheat on me, which he eventually did. Big shocker. But I stayed. I believed I could be the one that would change him, that my love would penetrate his heart, and he would see that what we had was truly special. But alas, that did not happen. He continued to treat me badly. Better said, I allowed him to continue to treat me badly. I felt consistently rejected until it got so painful, I left. 
Now, I wish I could say I knew why and how I attracted that kind of relationship then, but I didn't. It was only later in my 20s when I started to understand that we attract relationships based on our issues until we heal them that I had my major aha about this particular soulmate, John. You see, as you know from listening to this podcast, rejection and feeling less than other girls was a core wound for me. Also, I was consistently trying to prove myself by achieving and being good. So of course I attracted a man who triggered my issues of rejection and who felt like I constantly needed to prove myself to, to win over. Fortunately, my choices in men have been much better since, but all have still come with their own learning. And I'm so grateful for all the soulmates I've had because they've helped me grow. I'm also grateful for the time I have not been in a relationship or seeking one out as that has been the most profound time for me to heal old stuff and date myself. And that is the place Michael is coming to, a place of recognition of how he's been dating from pain rather than love. He's also coming to the awareness that the soulmate he most needs to seek out a relationship with is himself. So as you're listening to this call, consider... Are you longing for a soulmate so much so that it's causing you to suffer? Do you keep dating the same person over and over and over again, but with a different face? Could old issues from your childhood be impacting who and how you are dating? Are you in a fantasy-based relationship? Could it be time to take off those rose-colored glasses? So keep these questions in mind as you listen to my sweet call with Michael. Well, hey, Michael, welcome to the show. What's your question? Hey, Christine. Uh, Thank you for having me. Uh, My question is, how do you kind of know when the person for you is the right one in moving past hurts that you've had or to move forward with like good relationships, like in a healthy manner? And I guess I wanted to, to kind of give you a little backstory. I kind of like just had a history of kind of maybe dealing and dating where they may have not been the best relationships for me. And so in ending them um, and kind of trying to move forward, I've always felt kind of bad about like closing them off or what if I'd done something differently or how could I like make things better? And then I end up kind of crashing and like feeling bad about myself. And it's kind of hard for me to kind of move past that mm. into something that's good. That That's right in front of me because I'm constantly thinking about, you know, what, what happened in the past relationships. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So you're in kind of a loop, basically. Yeah, yeah. I kind of end up in a loop where mm-hmm. uh, it's like, it's like, hey, this, this may be a good opportunity, but I'm thinking about these past things. And then I kind of feel down on myself and then it like wrecks my kind of self-esteem. And so right. I just kind of want to be able to try to like move past that into like something that's positive for me. Sure. Sure. Well, it's a really good question. And I acknowledge you for looking, looking at this. So if you could get just a little bit more specific, what in, in past relationships, when you've ended them, why did you end them? What wasn't working? Well, I think, um, what wasn't working is I probably had expectations about what I wanted it to be versus then what it actually was. And so like, say if I meet someone that's like in my first mind, I'm already thinking like marriage and like, mm-hmm. you know, like we're going to be together forever and da, 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 da. And then when it doesn't kind of match up to that or it kind of ends, I'm like, Oh my gosh, it's like kind of wrecked what I thought it was or what it, what it could have been. And, and so instead of like, moving past that, like trying to open myself up to new opportunities, I kind of focus on that past. And then I kind of bring that cycle maybe into the new relationship, which like I still kind of run towards like this kind of marriage type thing or what I think a perfect relationship would be. Gotcha. Okay. When was the very first time, and it doesn't necessarily have to be romantic, could have been with a parent. When was the very first time you got your heart broken? Um, Probably when I, when I was a young kid, um, I, I was adopted, so I got raised by my grandparents, my grandmother. So I wasn't raised by my mother, and so I think it, it that was probably like around that time. And then um, I think just two things when I was fourteen, um, I remember this girl like I was in high school, and so I remember this girl telling me that I was the ugliest guy she had ever seen in her life, and so that. Um, really kind of impacted like how I like looked at myself and what I, and 
and going forward in relationships as well. Okay. So those are two significant things. And again, like I acknowledge your honesty, I acknowledge your self-awareness. So let's look at both of those. So with, with mom, when was she in your life at all in the beginning or when did she, what, what was the situation? Um, so I was living in another state and my mother just wasn't, just wasn't able to like care for me and my siblings. And so I got adopted by my grandmother when I was 10 years old. Um, but she had, my mother had been kind of in and out of my life up until like I moved out of the, so I became an adult. So it wasn't, um, we didn't have like a tight relationship. Okay. She was never really around. Okay. So as you know, our relationships with our mothers are incredibly significant. And when talking about heterosexual relationships, a, a man relationship with his mom has significant implications on his dating life, as does a woman's with her father's. Um, and in any kind of relationship, heterosexual or otherwise, our parents do play a significant role on what we play out in romantic relationships. But let's just look at your situation. So even though you were, weren't adopted until you were 10, pretty much your whole life, you didn't have that unconditional love and presence from a mother. Correct? Correct. Okay. So that is a, a core wound that you're going to try to attempt to fill with a romantic relationship. And that's very normal to, to do that. The, the problem is instead of really looking for a wife, you're looking for a mother. Okay. Now I know consciously you're like, what is this crazy Christine talking about? Like, no, I'm attracted to these women. Like I'm not looking for a mother, but can you see that a part of you, since you had to go through something and I, I just also just want to acknowledge your journey because you've had some tough soul lessons, you know, for whatever reason, your path mm -hmm. has been challenging up until this point. But the beautiful thing is you're asking these questions now and you can create a different family than the one that you came from. And what I really mm -hmm. want to support you in doing is creating it from your heart, from your values, from your whole self, rather than creating it from your wounding. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that love from a mother, especially to a son is like she's the first woman that, you know, tells you you're handsome and believes in you and encourages you. And you never really got that. And so you okay. want a relationship so badly so that you can feel that way. And the trouble is it's going to project a lot of expectation on any woman that comes in because it's like you're going to want her to fill that core wound. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Right. And so when you then when you realize she can't coupled with the fear of, is this another woman who's going to leave me? Maybe I should just end it first so that I don't have to get my heart broken again. So you've got both of those dynamics going on, Michael, and it's causing sort of this I want them, I have them, but then I get scared. So they're going to go away. But then that core wound is activated again. So I need to get a woman in my life. But then I'm thinking about the old one. And it's just, that's why you're looping. You know saying? And, and it's kind of like that loop. And then it's like, well, maybe I need to like go back and like fix whatever it was that, that wasn't right with this person, you know? And so I was like kind of constantly running back or something like that too. And so, um, I guess I always just thought because I had my grandmother would fill whatever void that not having my parents in my life did. And talking to you makes me see that it, it, it's different. Right. Well, it helped. And God bless her. It helped. However, up until 10, you didn't really have it. Right. And, and still the truth is, you know, you didn't have your mom and you still don't today. You had a grandmother and she's great. Like, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm definitely saying that was totally a blessing. I'm just also mm -hmm. wanting to support you in understanding, you know, what, how this is impacting your dating life and your romantic life. 
because Mm -hmm. it's not about any of these women that you've dated. It's about going back and healing the relationship with your mom. And what that, what that girl said to you when you were 14 too, is sort of just like another, um, outward experience of, cause here's the thing when we're little, if we feel rejected by our parents, we feel like something's terribly wrong with us. We feel like we feel unlovable because they're our mom and dad, like they're supposed to love us. So when we feel rejected or abandoned by them, even though as adults, we can go back and look of, well, they weren't that sane or they were messed up or they had all these problems or whatever, that, that little kid inside of us, uh, inside of us took it very personally. Do you understand that? Yeah. Right. And so what that girl said to you at 14, you're, you're not the ugliest. I know that. I know that without even seeing you. It's just like that was another outer, outer sort of fear projected because you felt so rejected and like something was wrong with you and something made you unlovable. Right. And what I'm here to tell you is that it wasn't your fault that you are incredibly lovable. I can feel your heart, Michael. I can feel it. I can feel how much love there is to give. And, and I think that's part of why this is so challenging is because I can even kind of picture you as a little boy and you're a very bright light. And the fact that you kind of got your heart squished so early has been really hard, but you have the chance to open it again. You have the chance to do some work and go back to that time Forgive your mother, forgive yourself for buying into any misunderstandings that there was anything wrong with you to know that on some level, you know, you picked her to learn what you needed to learn and to know that you can come into a relationship with a woman as a whole and complete man who knows he is lovable, who knows that he's not someone to reject, who knows that he has so much to offer, not to make up for any imperfections, but just because of who he is. And you can then stand strong in being in a relationship because you love loving and you found so much love in your heart versus getting into a relationship because you need love to fill a void. Okay. I understand. Is your mom in your life at all right now? Uh, yeah, we, I mean, we, we converse, I mean, we talk um, and stuff like that now. So it's not like a bad relationship that I have with her now. Uh, we talk um, not super frequently, but when we do, it's not it's not bad or anything like that. And I think it's it's not that, you know, and I, and I felt like I've forgiven her. I just think just the residual of, like, dealing with that, you know, that I never really... Um, didn't start dating or anything like that. I became an adult, and then I was like, "Wow, what are all these like emotions and feelings, rejection, being rejected, and doors kind of closing with relationships? Like, where is all this coming from?" Then, you know, I was like, "Wow, I'm, I'm really like impacted by these like women like moving out of my life or like closing something down, and I'm trying to move forward from that and being something that's like healthy." Right. Right. And and the thing is, like, you know, you keep reactivating the same wound. It's just like the mom wound over and over and over again. So it's great that you are in a place where you talk to her. It's great that you've done a lot of forgiveness. Um, but I think that the forgiveness that's in front of you right now is really to forgive the misunderstanding that you were rejected, that you were unlovable in any way, that it was your fault in any way. So just, just kind of close your eyes for a moment and picture like little Michael, picture yourself when you were, you know, just a little guy, like six or seven years old, or even 10 when you knew that you were going to go live with grandma. And what, if you could just kind of speak as if you were that, you know, little seven, eight, nine, 10 year old boy, what do you think he would say? What's really, what is he really feeling that maybe he never got to express? I wish that both my parents were around. I wish I didn't have to kind of go through uh, what I did to, like, have to get down to where my grandmother uh, was. 
Um, I wish that I had just kind of like a more normal uh, childhood and upbringing. And so I wouldn't have to like feel abandoned or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. And he probably is like, I'm scared. And why is this happening? (laughs) Did I do something wrong? Yeah, what's wrong with me? Did I do something wrong? Why doesn't my mother want to be around me? Right. Right. So do you see how these kind of unanswered questions and fears are still with you? Yeah. Yeah. So your your inner work and your work with yourself is to have a dialogue with that little guy. See, what happens is, you know, when we're little and we have these events, there's no one there, oftentimes for most of us, to one, make sure we're talking about our feelings and two, hold a space for us to feel our feelings without forming all these misunderstandings. So imagine if, okay, there was 10-year-old little Michael and I was there and I said to him, oh, sweetheart, I know you're so sad and so scared, but one thing I really, really want you to know and remember is this wasn't your fault. Your mommy's just going through grown-up things that don't make sense right now, but what you have to know is that you didn't do anything wrong and you are so lovable. And this has nothing to do with you. And I know that's really, really hard. And I know it's really sad. But it's important that you know that. Was anyone there saying that to you at the time? No. Yeah. Right. And so I'm happy to say it to you. And it's important you say it to yourself too. And you start to connect with that little guy inside of you. Because no matter what, whether it's our mom or our dad or whoever... You know, our parents do the best they can, and it's up to us to reparent. So instead of kind of investing so much time and energy into trying to find a romantic relationship right now, what I'd encourage you to do is to invest a little more energy into your relationship with you, especially that Mm -hmm. younger part of you, and start to parent him and love him in the way that you always longed for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. When you're out dating and in romantic relationships, um, how do you show up? Like how, how do you get women's attention? How do you show up in the beginning of a relationship? Like what are the patterns that you go into? Um, I think I just kind of, I think I tend, I, one thing I know is I do way too much and don't get a lot back because I, I don't, I think I may feel like I need to like kind of prove myself or show myself that I'm show that, that I really care. Or that I'm really like interested in this person. Um, so I, I, I tend to, um, do a lot without getting little in return. So mm. it, it, you know, so I tend to, I'm the one that's maybe planning all the dates. I'm I'm spending all the money. I'm making sure, checking in with them, talking to them, calling them. You know, always initiating, always initiating, always initiating, but very, but getting very little return mm-hmm. from them. And it's not even like we're like boyfriend and girlfriend. With I'm just like sporadically dating. Right. Well, first of all, I'm sure there's a lot of women listening that would be like, oh my God, I'd love to date a guy like that. (laughs) But I have a feeling the women that you might be attracting may be taking advantage of that. And the reason that I say that is because you're doing it from a place of needing to compensate, feeling like you need to compensate, right? From feeling like you need to prove, from thinking that there's something unworthy about you and you need to like bring so much and and of course you're not getting it returned because you know the the people that you're attracting aren't see when we're not whole and complete and coming from just a place of love it's hard to attract people that are coming from that same place mm-hmm. so you may be attracting women that are similar to your mom And 
your mom, your biological mom, isn't ever going to be able to give you what you wanted from a mother. You're going to need to give that kind of parenting love to yourself and start loving yourself and treating yourself like you do other people so that you can attract the kind of woman that sees you, that loves you, and that is going to give back to you as well. Because by trying to fill the void of not getting enough, you're overgiving to get, but you're getting nothing in return. Right. And, and because of this kind of core wound, not being in any relationship, so that means either not dating or not obsessing about a relationship in your head, is very uncomfortable, which is why you're in this loop. So that's why mm-hmm. I'm encouraging you to be like, just take a dating hiatus so that you're not okay. obsessing about a past one or obsessing about getting a new one and date yourself and do some deep mm-hmm. healing around this, the mother stuff. Because I know, I know you are going to make some woman an amazing partner, but I want you to be able to do that from a place of knowing that there's nothing you need to compensate for. There's nothing you need to make up for. You're totally lovable and you don't need to do and do and do for fear that they're going to leave you. Right. And that's, that's true. And that's what I need to do. So what's present for you now? I've talked a lot. I want to hear from you. Um, I think for, for me right now, I'm glad that you kind of said, you know, things you said, so I appreciate that. And just kind of being able, you know, taking a dating hire, this probably would be a great thing for me to do. Just so I'm not kind of like, you know, racing from like one thing to another and maybe even just building like relationships and without even trying to like date, you know, just being like building like healthy friendships and yes. stuff. And, and uh, you know, being able to like give myself that love that, that I deserve and not trying to like give it out to somebody else wanting them to give me what I, I haven't been giving myself. And so that puts, um, unreal expectations on her to like love me in a way that I'm not loving myself. Oh, yes. You're bringing tears to my eyes. You got it. You got it. You are a very wise soul and you're a very strong, strong soul. And part of your strength is your vulnerability and in your honesty, and is your courage. Your strength isn't the kind that muscles through things. You're the kind of strength that actually women really crave. Women, healthy women, that would make you a wonderful partner. You know, no one's perfect, you know, we're always working on ourselves, but, you know, I define someone healthy, someone who's willing to take responsibility for themselves and has a high degree of emotional intelligence. And, and we are drawn to men who have done the work on themselves, who have the level of emotional intelligence and vulnerability that you have, Michael. I think you're, you're much wiser and stronger than you give yourself credit for. So follow your inner wisdom. Stop looking for love outside of you. There's so much there within. And that will shift everything. Thank you so much, Kristen. Such a moving call. I got teary at the end because I was so touched by Michael's awareness and how he was taking a stand to be his own soulmate. And I'm getting teary thinking of all of you who had an aha from that session and are doing the same. As my friend Coop Blackson says in his new book, you are the one. You are the one you've been looking for. And when you truly know that, you stop looking for someone else to complete you. And you can draw in a relationship based on your values, where you're headed versus your issues and where you've been. 
So let's break down this call. Number one, stop dating your parents. You heard how Michael was attempting to find a mother replacement and kept dating women who were like his mother. Now I know his mom was doing the best she could and had a lot of hurt in his own life, which caused her to show up as a not very present loving mother who wasn't really there for him. So he ended up dating women that didn't really treat him well and weren't really there for him. This is the problem with trying to fill a void left by a parent through dating. We long so badly for the love of the parent we didn't feel that we attract people just like them, which we think is a solution, but it's even more of the problem because they are just like them. For example, I see a lot of women whose father wasn't present continue to date unavailable men. They're attracted to men who were like their father because they're trying to heal that daddy wound, but they end up with men like their father and they end up getting cheated on, abandoned, so on and so forth. So it's just better to heal the issues so that you don't go out looking for that love you didn't get from your parent in a romantic relationship. Also, isn't it amazing and heartbreaking that people can give us lots of acknowledgement and compliments throughout our life, but we remember that one really bad thing that someone said to us when we were a kid or a teenager. You heard how that one comment made to Michael is still with him. We have to bring love and forgiveness to those places inside and fill ourselves with our own loving acceptance. It's time to let those critical things people said to you or about you go. It's also time to let go of those fears around rejection, abandonment, and getting hurt. Otherwise, you'll continue to attract them. And in your work and healing process, it's not enough just to forgive the person. You heard Michael talk about how he forgave his mom. But forgiveness is not just about forgiving the person. We need to forgive the misunderstandings and limiting beliefs that we bought into and connect with those younger parts of ourselves. For example, maybe you've forgiven your father for leaving or forgiven your mother for being an alcoholic. But have you forgiven the misunderstanding that you did something wrong or that your mother didn't love you or that your father thought life without you would be better or that you can't trust people? or that love is scary. Dig deep into those misunderstandings and forgive those. And finally, please take off the rose-colored glasses. Have a relationship based in reality, not fantasy. If you're sitting around in a relationship thinking you can change someone, remember my story about John in the beginning. We cannot change other people. I repeat, we cannot change other people. The only person you can change is the one you look at in the mirror every day. You. Create your relationships from values rather than wounding. Attract relationships from a whole and complete place. And you'll end up with what I call a side-by-side partnership. Two whole complete people. We're never perfect. We're always learning and growing. But we know we're whole and complete. We're not attempting to fill a void. Standing side-by-side, looking in the same direction. So some takeaways for you. Is there a little boy or girl inside of you that has some misunderstandings that really need to be healed? Are you in a fantasy-based relationship or issue-based relationship? Could it be time to either end it or transform it? And if you know you've been dating to either fill a void or resolve issues or both, perhaps it's time for a little dating hiatus, time to date yourself. And always, always, always take time to date you. Whether you're in a relationship or not, Doing those things on your own, making time just for you is so, so important to your emotional and mental well-being. And finally, no matter what your relationship status is, my prayer for you is that you know how lovable you are, that you fall back in love with yourself and realize that you are the soulmate you're looking for. I know this episode touched on a lot of topics that are really up for people. So if you benefited from this episode and think others would too, please, please share it. Sending you so much light and many blessings. Thank you for listening to Over It and On With It. I love hearing from you. So please post your comments or questions at christinehasler.com slash podcast. That's also the place you can sign up to receive coaching from me in an upcoming episode. And if you love this show, please share it and subscribe on iTunes. You can find all my social media handles and sign up to be part of my community at christinehasler.com. Until next week, here's to getting over it and on with it. Much love and many blessings. Much love.